series of seminars we're organizing this academic year uh, in honor of my late friend Bill White, with whom I was uh, associated for many years, uh, with work and reading each other's work and whatnot. Um, Bill passed away last year. We had a lovely session for him at the uh, French Historical Studies last spring in Pittsburgh, and we thought, eh, let's have a seminar before the rest of us Bill's age all die. Um, and so the idea of this was in the fall we'd have people who are in fact of that generation. There happened to be a large number of us who got a PhD in early modern French history, particularly working on the 16th and 17th centuries, right around 1980, give or take five years, one year or the other. Then there was kind of a, a, a lull. There were a couple of people in between. And then right around 2000, there was another large group. So the idea was in the spring, we're going to have the second group, this sort of second generation, if you will. Um, and our first uh, guest in that is Professor Catherine Crawford, who it's always, sorry, you always make, you and Megan and everybody else always make me feel old because they were close friends of my first student, Sarah Chapman. You were in Paris together. We were all in Paris together. You were all in Paris together. And so it brings me back to when I first taught in a graduate student. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> uh, they've all gone on to bigger and better things. Um, many Which of means you. We got jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, jobs are good. And in fact, didn't you and Sarah? You were applying for the same job. We, we, we interviewed for the same. We actually, when I found out it was her for one of the jobs that we interviewed for, I'm like, ah, that's Sarah's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so her first book was one that uh, a number of you are familiar with on uh, Farrell's performance as gender leniency in the of France, um, which is one of the first studies of uh, regency, most of the regents in the of France were women um, that seemed to have escaped everybody for a long time. Um, then her second book, which I brought a copy of, if you are want a quick read to sort of give yourself some background on this topic in really modern Europe, this is the place to start. Uh, European sexuality is 1400 to 1800, which is in the, I believe, now defunct New Approaches to European History, published by Cambridge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm published in this series, too, yeah, so I <laughs> did a lot more earlier than you did. So did Mac. Mac's not here, by the way, because he's uh, in the moment. Oh, dear. Um, That's so he's off being checked Being out. sick. Yes, being sick. Um, and then her third book was Sexual Culture of the French Renaissance, and we can see how that one bled into what she's going to talk about today. But before she starts, as we do with all of these things... I think it's number four. Really? Yeah. What's the fourth? It may not be up yet. No, it's not. It's not up yet. The uh, fourth one is the Eunuchs and Castrati. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, honestly, I don't remember. Something about normativity and early class. It had a really great title, and then they made me change it to something that like libraries would buy. Yes, <laughs> we're all familiar with that. <laughs> but basically, it's Men Without Children. <laughs> yeah, that's a good title. That's awesome. Isn't it awesome? Yeah, no, that's what they should have gone with. Anyway, so the way we start off is that we go around and like introduces themselves to those of you who are in my class. Uh, I'm Professor Collins at the Joy of France here, and a bunch of people at the table studying with me. And okay. uh, my name is Susan Nero. I'm a second semester master's student here at Georgetown. Did I say anything else? No, more so. Okay. What are you interested in? Um, I look at, I'm interested in the intersection of art and politics and early modern. Excellent. <laughs> She's applying to PhD. <laughs> waiting to hear. <laughs> I'm Dave Menezes. I'm the um, first year PhD student uh, here. Uh, I'm studying uh, the Dutch and the Portuguese in South Asia. Don't know anything about that. Hello. Um, I'm Brenda Cameron Stanky. I'm a first year PhD student in the history department here also, and I study medieval and environmental history. Uh, I'm Matt Clotta. I'm a first year master's in the history program, and uh, I'm interested in. Uh, modern German economic history. Not, not bad, but not cool like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really important. <laughs> oh, sorry. You shouldn't say something like that. <laughs> I have no filter. Yeah, that's um, I'm Sam Kant. I'm a fifth year 
PhD student since uh, I'm working on dissertation about religious tolerance in 17th century France. Mm -hmm. Go around the back there, uh, come back. Hi, I'm in Professor Lennox's class. My name is Cheryl. I'm a senior here. I'm not studying anything as cool <laughs> as them. I'm just a guff major and a history and theology minor. I'm also in Professor Leonard's class. My name is Hannah Brown. I'm a junior in the college and I study public health. Um, I'm Ellie. I'm also in Professor Leonard's class and I'm an exchange student from the UK and I study history. What part of the UK? I'm from London but I'm at the University of Edinburgh. I say, that doesn't sound like watching. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Rebecca, I'm a first year master's student and um, field area of interest is migration. I'm Sarah. I'm Jocelyn, I'm in Leonard, Mrs. Leonard's class um, and I'm a history major with concentration in the Middle East. Um, I'm Jasmine, I'm also in Professor Leonard's class. Um, I'm a senior history major, concentrating on Latin America. I'm Michael, I'm also in Professor Leonard's class. Uh, I'm a junior and I'm a medieval studies major. I'm Adam, I'm in Professor Leonard's class. I'm a freshman, I'm on the third so far. What did she get you all to do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, I'm Nathan Michaelowitz. I'm a fifth year PhD student at George Mason studying with Mac Bolt, and I'm writing my dissertation on French diplomacy with the Ottoman Empire during the French Wars of Religion. I'm Professor Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I brought these students here today. I'm teaching sex and celibacy this, class, this semester in pre-modern Europe, focusing on nuns and prostitutes. And we read some of your stuff, so it seemed absolutely perfect to bring them today. And we just did Foucault today as well. So. <laughs> you are good. I'm Ashley Corwin. I'm a seventh year PhD student here. Um, writing my dissertation on the and the There was never any of that. <laughs> I'm Jacob Burnham. I'm a third year PhD working on French and South Asian colonial. Islam. Oh. Islam. <laughs> Um, I'm Natalie Donnell. I'm a first year PhD student and I study uh, women in politics in 16th century France. I'm Elizabeth Cross. I'm an assistant professor here at Georgetown and I work on France and its empire in the long 18th century and with a focus on political economy. And my current project is about the French East India Company in the Revolutionary Era. Oh. All right. So, what do you want me to do? <laughs> You all read. So let me tell you, okay, so I'm like, I like actually kind of suck at writing articles. So to make myself write them, um, I accept when people say write 7,000 words on X, because it's like a good disciplinary practice. And this was 7,000 words on sex and gender and the body. And then I was told, say something about theories of the body and about hermaphrodites. That's all the guidance I have. It is currently 7,109 words, which means I'm probably going to have to lose the penguins, and I'm probably going to have to use the ugly giant bags of mostly water, which for the old people is Star Trek. For the young people, like, oh, you are such a nerd. Um, but if they'll give me an extra 200 words, I'm keeping the penguins and the ugly giant bags of mostly water. Um, and I took it in part because I thought that my next project was going to be about sexual identity. And about that there is such a thing. So in I think in the early modern, pre-modern, medieval, you know, probably ancient world, um, in that people uh, don't identify as you know heterosexual, homosexual. Of course, we all know that. 1869, blah blah blah. But uh, they do identify as wives, as mothers, as married people, as single people, uh, etc and as virgins slash celibates slash chaste. And all those are sexual identities. And some of them are identities about not having sex, of course, but then nonetheless. So I thought that that was what I was going to write about. But I'm not. <laughs> um, I was instead reading um, The Merchant of Venice, because I have a graduate student upon whose committee I am in English. Um, and she's writing this really cool article about how you can understand uh, the, the dynamics of that play through Bataille. Um, 
so I was reading the play, and I came up on the end of, I don't know if you, most people don't read it anymore because it's like, you know, one of those bad plays. Not least because it's kind of obviously, you know, anti-Semitic. Um, but at the end of it, there's this, you know, kind of wonky thing that happens, right, where Portia, um, you know, she dresses as a man and she does the whole, you know, quality of mercy thing. And then she gives her, um, she gets the ring off of, off of, what's his face? He's such a non entity, also his name, Kasanya. Um, and then she like tests him. You don't know this, do you? You're like, I'm like speaking Swahili to many of you. Anyway, she, so she, the whole point is that she actually wants to see if he's gonna tell her the truth about how he lost the ring. And I thought, huh. And then I thought, Aren't there an awful lot of stories of people lying about, oh, sex? So bed tricks, where you put somebody in bed to be a virgin because you're not actually a virgin, so you want them to have, you know, this kind of thing. It happens in plays. It turns out it happens in life, who knew? So I decided that the next thing is going to be about sexual deception. So this article is kind of being, is, is turned into a one-off. That's the long story. I will say as a coda to that, that when I told my partner that I was thinking about writing about sexual deception, she said, well, that's great. It's going to probably be a book. It will probably be several. What, what if you wanted to write about sexual authenticity? And I said, two paragraphs helps. Mm -hmm. Really, there is not. If you start looking for it, like deception is everywhere, authenticity is nowhere. Um, uh, and, and that is interesting, too, but I don't know what to say about that yet. Um, so. I haven't finished this, obviously, I mean, among other things, when I was reading it over uh, in the airport. I was like, ooh, there's some typos still. Sorry. Uh, but also, um, I, I know that the middle is too large and the end is a little too short, but I like the middle and I don't like the end. Nonetheless, I should probably do something about that. Um, and, uh, and so it's not done yet, I know that. Um, and, and so anything you have to say about it, I would happily scribble down in my book of things I scribble down along the point. Um, so, uh, so that that's that. Um, uh, and um, I forgot to say about the fourth book, if you're interested in such things, it's actually about how um, men who are castrated are treated uh, as basically kind of forced transsexuals and uh, as deliberately disabled. That is, they're treated as disabled, not quite men, uh, medically, legally, and socially, as well as for culturally. Um, so it takes up issues about uh, uh, what it means to be disabled, what it means to be trans in an early modern context. Obviously, those aren't the words they use. Um, but believe me, they're doing it to so that's kind of all I have to say. Okay. For now. Well, let's open it up. Since you're a little red. I'm going to start with that okay. kind of a methodological question okay. related to this and also to, to many other things. And it's a, to me a, a, a tricky question. And I've, I've been thinking about it more often because of. All these people doing family DNA. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I'll give uh, I'll give a, a, an example of that um, from my first cousin, right? um, my father's side. And his mother was was not related to me. Um, her ancestors came over to Connecticut in the 1630s. Right? So he got a DNA report back, and he was a given percentage of some very obscure Asian, Central Asian mm -hmm. tribal group, so yeah. to speak. And I looked at that and I said, I'd be willing to bet that one of the tribal groups in Connecticut was the descendants of it. I tracked it down, which of course they were. Mm -hmm. Now, needless to say, there was not a marriage between mm -hmm. the yeah. Native American yeah. and particularly in the 1630s in Connecticut when they were doing very unpleasant things to each other. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot more of this kind of stuff. And, yeah. and so one of the things that's fascinating to me is how we as historians balance out the prescriptive sources yeah. that have all kinds of discussion of what sex should be like or what marriage should be like. Yeah. And I think there's somebody like Alberti, who mm -hmm. you might be using, 
and you know, we're de la familia, yeah. and of course he never married. Yeah. And then there he talks about how great your family is, and his relatives cheated him out of his inheritance. I so I, I always thought it was, I, I always thought it was a satire. I did too. I, I think did it's too. a satire. And I, and I'll tell you, the, the Italianist who was, no, this could not be. <laughs> <laughs> It's a satire, I'm sorry. It's a satire, it's definitely right. a satire. So, so how do we, I mean, now that we're getting more and more people doing research on private writings and stuff, where we might discover mm -hmm. people's actual sexual behavior, or we discover DNA right. that, uh, you know, my own daughters through their mother's side are part Ashkenazic Jewish, why their grandfather's ancestors came from the part of Alsace where the villages have lots of Jews. Mm -hmm. right? And so it's perfect sense but also unlikely to have intermarried in the late 18th century, yeah. which is what the statistics are doing. So how do we as historians go back and look at these prescriptive sources, so many of which are written by ecclesiastics, mm -hmm. who presumably are A, not married, and B, not supposed to be having sex anyway. So I'm Certainly saying, not supposed to be thinking about it. Not supposed to be thinking about it. So how do we balance that out with you know, empirical research on mm -hmm. people's real lives? That is such a great question. Um, and it's something I think about a lot, um, because I'm really, I'm, I, I'm actually more interested in things that people read and saw. Mm -hmm. So cultural products, I am in that sense a cultural historian, and not, you know, that said, um, one of the ways I think about it is, well, if, I'm pretty sure that there was a, strange thing happening here. So, for example, in my, in my last book, um, the, the, in 1587, the Pope decrees that Castrati cannot marry. And this is happening, he decrees this, of course, because Castrati are marrying. And it's freaking people out. Because you're not supposed to do that if you can't have kids, and he castrated you know you can't have kids. If it turns out that you can't have kids, and da 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 well, you know, okay, fine. But if you know you can't, and they're supposed to dissolve these marriages and so on. So then what happens in actual cases of actual people who go work, cast out, and get married? And there are enough that you can then kind of follow out how they, they negotiate the prescriptive, which is in this case law. Uh, and it's you know piled on with a bunch of other kinds of uh, prescriptive stuff. Um, so I tried, I tried when I can to balance these things out. So like for instance, uh, in the sexual deception piece, uh, you know, there's there's huge amounts of this going on on stage, but is that representative? No, in a sense, it's not. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen almost Otherwise every day. Otherwise, it wouldn't be funny. Otherwise, it wouldn't be funny or scary. Right. And and so, uh, you know, for instance, in the the midst of there's like a kind of rage in uh, in Elizabethan and Jacobean plays for bed tricks for the and then they substitute somebody in. Well, it turns out that there was one, and it was like a big deal. Um, uh, and it was a big deal case, and everybody knew about it. So were they writing it because of the case, or was the case because of they were writing about it? And sorted that out again. But they, there is an interaction that goes on it, so that's part of my answer, is that I try to, to, to match it up. And sometimes you can't. Sometimes the fact of like a huge amount of prescriptive noise is in and of itself kind of interesting to me. So, um, for instance, the French don't ever embrace Castrati as singers. Um, they just don't like the sound. They have a whole different way of doing opera, which, quite frankly, I don't understand because it's kind of weird. Um, and opera's weird unto itself, but that's a different kind of weird. Um, but they write a huge amount about uh, about the meaning of Castrati. It's all prescriptive. There aren't, I mean, there are, there are, you know, two documented French Castrati that I was able to find, and then a few more who come over from Italy when Mazarin invites them. And that's like it. Compared to any other country, including America, that's not. I mean, they were actually, they went on a tour in America a lot, and people would talk about them. Um, so the French are, the French are obsessed with this, because they don't have them. So that in and of itself is very interesting to me. So sometimes it's sometimes that's that's what I'm interested in. Um, uh, but the other the other thing is that you know people will have complained to me and they're and they're not entirely wrong 
uh, at some points the cultural doesn't connect. And, uh, and then my answer is yes, but people are still talking about it. They're still interested in it. Doesn't that, doesn't that matter? So um, that doesn't entirely answer your question, but that's how I mm -hmm. respond. One thing that maybe because a lot of people are not necessarily people who are familiar with early modern France, perhaps you could say a few words. I've always thought that, and of course you've talked about this in various places. Um, one of the things unusual about France, late 16th, early 17th century, is this succession of three kings, Henry III, Henry IV, and Louis XIII. You could argue about Louis XIV, too, but certainly three now. Made sexuality and sexual behavior just front and center in, in really, I would say, unique ways. Yeah. And, and Henry III is, likes to dress up uh, as a woman. He and his courtiers, there's plenty of literature attacking him. Henry IV is uber mis masculinity, and the government spends oodles of money and all kinds of propaganda to create a certain masculinity image of him. And then Louis XIII is bisexual, and there's all kinds of interesting speeches about how masculine he is. Yeah. some of the people who, who work for him. And so this is a topic that's unusually important, I would say, for, I mean, it happens at other times, yeah. but this is a period when it really comes to the fore. Maybe you could say a few words about you know, yeah. how that plays into this question of sexual definition, sexual identity, that it, 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 it's really prominent in politics yeah. at that particular point. Yeah. I would actually go back. I would actually say that in France, it, it starts with François Premier, mm -hmm. um, and then there's, and to to a some extent, um, Henry II. Although, because he dies so unexpectedly, mm -hmm. except prematurely once in Macbeth, that nobody dies prematurely. <laughs> 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 like, let me say it again. But I mean, he certainly was a, a randy dude. But yeah. but there wasn't the kind of ideological apparatus that that certainly built up um, earlier in the century. Um, so I think it actually starts then, and I think part of the reason it starts then is because you do have a dynastic shift. Because I think France actually really, from François Premier through Henry IV, is a kind of piece. Um, Louis XIII is his own unique weirdness, uh, and I think that leads into the, the, a second kind of set of questions mm -hmm. about this. Um, so, I and mean, I may be wrong, but this is this is how I've always thought of it. And actually, what with the shift of dynasty and the need to present the king, um, uh, you work hard for because the need to present the king as this kind of you know um, masculine figure in ways that that God, the word that's coming to mind is terrible. It's propagate that that make the king's. Uh, you know, sort of simultaneous political identity as king and father figure king go together in this way. Um, and I think Francois does that, you know, and, and it's done for him. I was recently thinking again, for instance, there's a somewhat, I mean, among people who care about these things, famous, um, it's called the Bisexual Portrait of Francois Fernet, and he's sort of dressed in a kind of melange of, of um, uh, ancient signifiers. So he has, you know, a, a, a helmet of Athena and a, and a, you know, a lion skin for Hercules. And he's kind of standing, kind of, you know, girly. And and the standard interpretation among, uh, among people who cared about this for a long time was that this was some sort of either satirical or a comment on his over dependence on women and so on and so on. Or uh, it could be a, an early version of what I think is a sort of constant battle law move, although other people don't agree with me, um, to try and kind of appropriate Neoplatonic coldness um, in the body of the monarch, and, and to render what is actually a really not very reliably heterosexual discourse as a kind of one about the potency of fertility at the same time. And that, and as a move, I think that's extremely difficult to do. Um, uh, and uh, it foregrounds sexuality in a way 
that they just they keep doing it. And each time they do it, there are different problems with it. So Francois does get knocked around for having too many girlfriends and being too dependent on them. And when you said Kathy Mullen was here and you know she's talked about uh, his um, really being kind of dominated by some of his, his mm -hmm. mistresses. Mm -hmm. Um, and people certainly do that, and and Henry II as well. And Henry II with you know Diane de Poitiers and and um, and then you know Charles, uh, you know I've had this I've had this argument with people like maybe Charles is actually the outlier because he actually because he comes because he came so young. We're really bracketing Francois II because really he had nothing going on and he died of that probably of mastoiditis, which makes me think he was kind of crazy because it's almost always a brain thing. I mean, like literally crazy, not like just kind of like you know, like Trump crazy. Not. <laughs> Had to say that. Had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you sure? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, um, if you think that, can you go back to Charles and just say Charles yeah, is the only one of the uh, once we get past Henry II. Yeah. Charles up until. Late into the mid 1590s, is the only one of any of these people who has any children. I know. Never mind a male child, yeah. any child. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Legitimate, yeah. illegitimate, whatever. Well, I mean, Henry II does. Charles. Right after Henry II. Yeah. Henry II has a bunch. Francois only doesn't last long enough. Charles right. takes him a huge long time. Um, uh, and because it takes him a huge long time, and this is actually why this, this you know, the, he's either an outlier or he's. Um, He's an outlier because he actually he manages to do it. He's not an outlier in that it takes him a really long time. He becomes king when he's too young, but even so, it takes him a really long time. And when he does, he makes a girl and an illegitimate son. This means there's a huge amount of attention on royal productivity. When you combine that with the kind of, I think, when you combine that with this kind of neoplatonic vision of the king, um, but circulating, the dissonance is actually going to increase the pressure. Um, I suspect, can't prove, never will be able to prove, but I suspect the problem is that they all, um, Henry II almost certainly had syphilis, and he almost certainly infected Catherine, mm -hmm. which means I think mm -hmm. all of those kids probably were right. sterile, right. or virtually sterile. Mm -hmm. um, and because um, Marguerite de Valois doesn't either, and she's right. left with everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, the rumors were that she had a child with somebody else. Well, the rumors were that, and the rumors were that, I mean, you know, Charles, it's not clear to me that Charles' kids were Charles's. Well, I'm know, just saying. It, it's not but clear that Henry IV's her first illegitimate child is yes. Yeah, right? it's true. As you talk. Yeah. And Henry, uh, you know, the, the, but what, what I think that does is with Charles and then Henry, it puts so much attention on their their reproductive function as, as actual father. Um, never mind that Henry III might be a little light in loafers. I, I think that's just that's almost a side issue. I think by yeah. then there's just too much going on. Um, which, you know, to my mind, explains why Henry IV goes way over the other direction. Um, but you also have the, the, in the early 1580s where he sponsors in 1581 an entire mm -hmm. year of processions mm -hmm. throughout the kingdom yep. to produce a child. Yep. And so it's very it's public really in the municipal public. archives it's on this. Really, really fascinating. I know. And he goes and he has his wife go on processions with mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. on at least three separate occasions and then big deal, like they you know, they walk to, to, to various shrines and, and there's no hiding. In fact, if anything, they ramp up yeah. how much they're putting into it, uh, and and uh, you know, is he shooting pikes? Is he not shooting? Doesn't matter in the end. Um, uh, uh, and Hen you know, Henry the Fourth is you know quite. I mean, really seriously, I think he's from a cabin. I mean, he just. I swear. Um, uh, and I think that that's that, that that image of him is actually you know is partly reactive, but it's also true that you know he got in trouble for that because yeah. being too much that way is also a problem, um, and it certainly didn't make his home life any easier. One of the few things that Bepa peeps in his 
biography mm -hmm. criticizes. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, and then you know, to go on, the what's what's set up in this dynamic between from Francois Premier through Henry IV is going to just keep in, in inflecting how these guys are read. So Louis the Thirteenth, who bisexual, asexual, just a weird dude, don't know, definitely weird dude. Um, Louis the Fourteenth, who's sort of, you know, again a quiet womanizer. Louis the Fifteenth, also. And then, you know, Louis XVI, who I think was sort of like a legal, and he kind of wobbled, but he didn't, well, he did fall down. Um, <laughs> but all of them are judged by this standard. And, and I think the standard is actually set in this kind of you know, dynamic that really is, becomes problematic under Charles and, uh, and the, the monarchy doesn't ever really regain really balance. It's all just going to be the focus. Um, I want to uh, push this a little bit on the on the sexual identity thing. And, mm -hmm. and for, please. When you started off at the beginning and you said you know, your book is sexual identities, and so you clearly think that there are sexual identities in the pre modern period. And you said that they don't use terminology like heterosexual or mm -hmm. homosexual. But that there are nuns, there are wives, there are There's all sorts right. But then you, but then that conversation just went to where you talk about people being light in the loafers and bisexual yeah. and and uh, gay or not mm -hmm. uh, in terms of Louis the Thirteenth or mm -hmm. you talk about England and James and stuff. So it seems to me that there are two things going on in terms of sexual identity. I, I truly believe that you know a nun has a certain sexual identity, but the nun, the monk, the husband, the wife, these are phases. These are choices. Mm -hmm. These are very different types of identity in terms of the way we talk about sexuality now. Mm -hmm. And whereas they may not call people homosexual or heterosexual, they do have a notion of a sexual identity that's based in something not choice, mm -hmm. I would say, when we talk about all these people that they mock for being too effeminate or you know, not being appropriate with who they're with and stuff. So how do we understand pre-modern sexual identity when there are ones that are sort of more like our own notion of it, but ones that would be more contextualized. Well, I think I think you're absolutely right. The, 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 many of these are phases. Mm -hmm. um, so how is that an identity as opposed and, to right, you know, being male also, or female? But also sodomite is right. Sodomite is certainly used. Right. Sodomite right. is used. Tribid is used. Mm -hmm. Fricatrice. Mm -hmm. um, rubster. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just yeah, isn't that awesome? Um, but all of these are also understood as, as things that, that, that people do. I mean, it's right, that could be a phase too. Right, right, it could be understood yeah. as a phase. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, the complaints, especially against effeminate men, although there's a, a you know, significant buzz about you know, masculine women, especially when they're heterosexual today. Um, I think that there's some sense that they have stopped trying to not be. And I, that project, which, you know, if I ever return to it, is going to be precisely about the fact that we imagine people as having something that you can look at them and say, ah, that is who they are. That is not necessarily who they think of themselves as, which is, which is one of the fundamental differences, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, on the other hand, where do we get our language about how we're, what people are. Well, I think it comes out of that. Uh, and, it, and it does sort of toggle because it is assumed that a nun is a virgin, is a nun is a virgin until she dies. It is assumed that a monk who takes a vow of chastity or celibacy will stay that way. It's assumed. <laughs> that they know. But they also know that they don't. And that, and that that's also, I mean, I think that's always sort of tugging at this mm -hmm. story. Um, I think it, it, and I think that that actually troubles our modern story. Um, when I teach this stuff, um, I always ask students, okay, so which is it better? Is it better to say that people are who they are, that they're gay, you know, they're born that way, whatever, or is it better to say they choose to be this way? And most people say, well, you know, born that way because then you know it's not their fault. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes, or. We could live, we could aspire to a society where what you choose to be is actually respected. Just saying. Um, when I'm old enough, you're old enough, he's old enough, the rest of you, the rest of you, <laughs> to, 
to think about how frightening it was to imagine that if it was you're born this way, that they would then just edit you out of the population. Right. That, um, and so I've never been comfortable with that. So I've always thought that it has to be something that we uh, that we uh, that we value as a, a politics small p, um, uh, and and that uh, much of the early modern conversation is about about fighting about that. Um, so in a sense, it isn't the same as you know a Foucauldian claim about it. Identity. Yeah. But it is absolutely necessary for a Foucaultian claim to be made in the 19th century. Um, and it might actually work better if we acknowledge that it is mobile. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think. But, you know, I live in Tennessee where we had to make a law that roadkill can be eaten. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really think about that for a second. You're allowed to eat roadkill. The law says so. Which means before you weren't. Who writes a law about that? <laughs> Jeez. It has to be relatively modern law, too. But there wasn't any roadkill. That's right. There weren't any roads. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was really struck, I think, it, along these lines of the um, association of hermaphrodites with sodomy. Mm, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Um, yeah. And, Especially between two women, and so, mm -hmm. you know, what was their definition of sodomy? Oh, all of them. Really? Yeah. No, I mean, the interesting thing about I that I didn't realize until I was reading about this more intensely. I mean, I read a bunch of sort of secondary stuff, but when I was actually was reading through cases and things, um, that the this um, if you've read like Anne Fausto Sterling, Sex and the Body, and she talks about the erasure of the category. Um, if you haven't, you should, because it's kind of brilliant, right? So if you say that a hermaphrodite must be X, and no one qualifies because no one has two functional sets of male, you know, so now there are no hermaphrodites. When in fact, we know that intersex is kind of spectrum, right? So one of the things that happens in these cases is as soon as you evacuate the herma hermaphroditic identity, you can apply the sodomy identity. And that just seems mean. Because first you're, you know, hoisting someone by the hermaphrodite petard, and then you're saying, ah, oh, no, you're a sodomite instead. Oh, shall we burn you? It just seemed really rude. Uh, and yet it happens over and over again. There's not like a physical description of what sodomy is, though? Oh, there's all kinds. Okay, but it just yeah. is a gamut. It is, well, it, it, yeah, so it is, I mean, there are a number of them, right? So, um, uh, the, the sort of standard panoply of non-reproductive things, okay. so anal sex. Um, oral really doesn't come up much, but they seem to think that oral sex is just weird. Um, a woman with an overly large clitoris, uh, uh, non-reproductive mutual masturbation will be sodomy. I mean, all that stuff, and they will describe all these Use of condoms? Um, late 17th century and mostly to prevent VD. Um, uh, and they were they were they were usually animal skins, yes. and you'd wash them and reuse them. So they were expensive. Considered sodomy too? No, by then not as much, because because the the act could be procreative if you didn't happen to have a, like a hat on. So they start they're starting to put it down. Um, but also because most of the men who don't want to get PD or get a woman pregnant are like no no no. Right, so these things are starting to go together in the late 17th century. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a book by Randolph Trumbach that argues that men sort of try to prove their heterosexuality by, you know, and that, that actually is sort of one of the things that's driving the boss. I'm not sure he's totally right about that, but it is clear that by the late 17th century, there is a category where you can have, you know, say, a condom and non reproductive sex, and it's not soft. Which is a bit of a fudge if you're if you were you know anything earlier. Yes. In in terms of your discussion of a uh, castrati in uh, France and mm -hmm. Italy, uh, did you consider how castrated men were presented across cultures? Like in the Ottomans, they were pretty uh, prominent in the bureaucracy and military. I did. I found it fascinating. Actually, we were talking about this before. Um, that uh, um, I mostly look at it because I don't I don't have Ottoman language skills. 
but I did look at terms of in terms of how Europeans understood um, uh, Unix at the at the Ottoman court, uh, and a little bit in other places, but mostly the Ottomans are the best sort of the most talked about and the, and the most emblematic in some ways. And the really striking thing is, it, is that there are um, there are two kinds in the Ottoman. Do you know this? They may not know this. There are two kinds. There are black ones and white ones, and they're literally black and white. Um, the black ones are from North Africa. The white ones are from what is now part of the Black Sea area of Russia. And black eunuchs were fully ablated, PSI testicles. Not surprisingly, for men who are crossing their legs, um, this was a very high mortality operation. Um, 70, 80% of men to whom this is done die because it's a lot of bleeding down there. Um, so they're extremely valuable, like literally rare commodity, hard to make, valuable. Um, white eunuchs are almost entirely um, just disabled testicles. Either they remove the testicles entirely or they, or they disable them as a new catastrophe. Um, and Black eunuchs are therefore safe to have in your inner spaces, in your era, you know, with your women, because they literally cannot do anything. Many of them can't even, you know, pee without assistance. So Europeans interpret this as the black ones are the most debased and the ugliest, and that's why they're with the women. Like, all, consistently, they misread this. In fact, the black ones are the most powerful. And the chief black eunuch is the most important figure after the Grand Vizier in the Ottoman Empire for most of the 17th century into the 19th century, really. Uh, and the chief white eunuch who guards the outer area is considerably lower down in the hierarchy. And all of the chief uh, household people are black eunuchs, save one. Uh, but Europeans totally misread that because of race. Just consistently, routinely, cannot do it can't go there. Um, and, when they, and when it's in their face, when they read, like, they, they can read ceremony, and they still read it wrong. Um, they're just like, well, this must be an accident. He must be here by because, you know, somebody else is sick. I mean, they literally say shit like this, right? Uh, it's, it's inconceivable to them, um, which tells me a couple things. One is that racism that we attribute to the, you know, 18th and 19th century is already in place. We're getting awfully close in the 17th century. Um, and another is that, that they don't, they really just don't understand how this whole thing works. Um, that those interior spaces and that kind of access are actually where it's at. That's the most important thing. They also miss a really important part, and, and actually many historians have missed it too, I think, um, which is that white eunuchs, again, almost all from the Black Sea area, so are almost all the women in the harem. So you wouldn't want to put them together in, in the space of the harem because they might know each other. Whereas black eunuchs and white harem women, they're not, they don't share language, they don't share culture, they don't share family, they don't, right? So there's a natural kind of division beyond the gender one. It's also a sort of ethnic and cultural one. They build into the space. Um, again, Europeans can't. So, yeah, talk about that a lot. How did you say? Yes. You. You? You. Me. You. Oh, okay. um, I said this about the, about the same thing? No, it was, it was just a comment on that. Wouldn't it also be that, I mean, you said the, the black eunuchs, um, uh, it seemed to me that in a very phallocentric centric society that losing your phallus would also be seen as a great debasement. I mean, that. In theory, you would not think just so, race, but you would think so. But keep in yeah. mind that you know the the Sultan has an extremely regulated sex life. They, I mean, the, the Western idea of you know he has access to this giant pair of women. Actually, he has if he produces a child with a woman, she's out of circulation. You know, like there's a whole. It's highly regulated. Um, in a sense, yes, and in a sense, no. It means that they're that they're in a kind of separate category. I just meant the Western interpretation oh, of yeah, them okay. as being, you know, these are the weakest because they lost their penis. Yeah. I mean, so that to me seems like, of course, they would see them as being oh, the, yes, the lowest 
because uh, yeah, so it, the Ottomans didn't do that. The right, Western, right. No, the Western interpretation. Doesn't, Absolutely. I mean, I can see race definitely being there as well, yeah. but yeah, that's all. Sorry, Jacob. No, that's good. Um, so my question is kind of talk more about kind of separating the performance and the mechanical difference mm -hmm. in something yeah. like ecclesiastical prescriptive forces mm -hmm. impotency mm -hmm. is. Are they seeing that as, I mean, it's one of the reasons to divorce for the church. Is it a mechanical issue or is it a performance issue? And how does that kind of understanding of the problem yeah. fit into this narrative? Um, that's actually a good question. So in canon law, um, uh, impotence is a germant impediment. So you can get a null for it. Uh, and how do you determine that? Well performance. <laughs> How do you test performance? Only in France do you actually put them in a room and make them like do it, right? Which, by the way, never works because, here's a big surprise, dude gets kind of anxious when everybody's watching. <laughs> Just saying. Um, well, the number of cases where the guy goes off and then like has kids with his yeah, it's no, just astonishing, right? It's true. Um, so, so there is this you know, there, there, there has been for a very long time this gray area. And there's a, a, a very large discussion in, in Catholic literature about this impediment that you can still marry if you're old, but you can't marry if you're castrated. Even though if you're old, you can't make babies, or you shouldn't, or you don't, or you can't. Not sure. Oh, well. And but the key thing is the not sure. So, um, uh, the, the theological fudge is it could work good enough. So they'll take that as, as acceptable as like performance can kind of get there. So you, again, you would think that backforming it, you could have castrati because some of them can, if they've been um, castrated after puberty has started, they can still get erections and they can still emit sterile seminal fluid. So wouldn't that mean? But no, because really there is no possibility post Thomas Sanchez. So it becomes not can you get it up, but can we assume that God could actually make something happen with those? God can't make something happen with something that isn't there, as opposed to something that is there but can be saved. So they're parsing the routine thing. Um, the mechanical division actually kind of wipes that out and basically says, and, 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 and is much more compatible than this modern version that would say, well, if you can make somebody happy, we're good. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Um, and technically, Catholics aren't supposed to be okay with that, but they'll go back to the, the impediment version which says, but if God wants to make it happen, he will. As if suddenly, somehow, your best efforts will reformulate itself. But whatever. We're not, you know, miracles happen. <laughs> so how does all this relate? Because you talk about not so much of this piece, but about the pretty dramatic change in medical knowledge in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. That, you know, yeah. it, it what is the relationship of that to reformulation of this kind of cultural culture? I wish I knew. I, this is actually something that I don't, I mean, I have, I, like, I used to think that the, that Thomas Kerr's explanation like so many people figure out about gender kind of worked. But actually, I've been reading a, a, a huge amount um, for a variety of reasons that are now inescapable, uh, completely lost to me, never mind explaining it to you. Um, 17th century medical literature. And here's the thing. His argument that, do you know this book? Do you know this book? Short version. So Thomas Lecar wrote a book called Making Sex. Huge important book, comes out in 1990. Argues that basically the ancient idea that there was one sex, male, and that women were inverted, undercooked women. Um, they only flipped that around in the, in the 18th century, late 17th, 18th century, when they start realizing that and I and, and there's something that's kind of true about that. That is, in in either the Aristotelian or the Galenic model, you can read the body this way. I mean, Aristotle's version is more 
polar, but really they are all one thing. And Galen's really is, a, you know, women are an inverted undercoat to men. However, increasingly, I'm not convinced. And here's why I rethought this, because in reading all the 17th century stuff, Galen comes in very late and very incompletely in the Western tradition. So in fact, they've fought in this polar way for a really long time. So what, so I'm not convinced anymore that the gender thing is driving that bus, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what is. But you know, I, I wonder, in, in looking at the cassette tape on this here, I wonder, and, and Kate's book about those but no, those mm -hmm. it's one of the things that's fascinating. She has several arguments where the people arguing in defense of Galileo mm -hmm. are using old fashioned type arguments and yeah. people using the new fashioned scientific ones are saying Galileo was wrong. Yeah. And and you read a lot of the discussions that she's talking about in our sort of teleological view of how science affected the way yeah. people thought. It's just blown to pieces because yeah. that's not and these are the leading philosophers, scientists, whatever, yeah. in France in the 1630s. And so I just wonder about sexuality as they're learning. They're not necessarily piecing it together in I think, ways. It, that, yeah. That, I think that's right. I think that they're not piecing it together in a linear way. Yeah. There's actually a great example of this. I don't know if she talked about this one, but I was fascinated by this. So we think Galileo, right, discovers the right way of things. Actually, he doesn't. If you do, he does, but he doesn't. Right? Do you know that? You know what this? That you know it all goes in in ovals. I'm not a science person. <laughs> 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 it's like high school, right? Look at me. It's all up in the ellipses. Yeah. Um, Galileo, uh, to be Copernicus, makes it all work by making everything go in circles, but go backwards about half the time. So that if you actually read, like, and if you look at copies of, of Copernicus from the from you know the late 16th century. Mathematicians, they like ignore the argument part and they go, they like argue his math because his math is actual shite. I mean, to make it work, it's just completely crazy. But he gets all the credit as the dude who figures it out. You know, my favorite thing about him, because in Poland at Jagiellonian University, yeah. it's a little kind of museum, yeah. and they have the Asco lab that he is. Yeah. It was made in Cordova in 1054, and all the inscriptions are there. <laughs> Like, that's almost as good as the time I saw the head of St. John the Baptist as a young boy. <laughs> what? You grew under one. <laughs> there were also two left feet of Catherine of Siena. Saw both of them. <laughs> so I don't, I actually, I actually think that one of the things that somebody needs to do, and I don't think it's Probably not that person. Is that I actually think that's that's kind of what happens is that you get kind of two steps forward in one thing. Say we figure out that there's a clitoris. Woohoo! We lost it for a thousand years. It's back, folks. And then we take a step back and go, ah, but you know the uterus is an inverted inverted penis. Like I think that they they they, and I think that there's probably a series of groups like that that mm -hmm. that actually explain each other if you could sort them all out. I think it's way more complicated than Kerr said, or indeed than, you know, Murray Daston and Captain Park have sort of said, well, he's not right. They haven't explained what is right, but... Um, That's always a lot easier. It is. It's a lot easier to say, you suck. Um, All right, so but since Professor Leonard's class has to leave in a couple of minutes, right? 4.30. 4.30, which is two minutes from now. Okay, yeah. Are uh, there any okay. questions from students in that class that give you priority? <laughs> There's a lot of it. Next. <laughs> so how does this, can I ask you all a question, how does this inform what you read in Foucault's History of Sexuality? Or vice versa? Since I know you read that. Yes. That's your letter. Volunteers. Michael, you all. I know my oh, class, so. Well, I had a separate question. Good, Good. let's if, go. Um, <laughs> women were the inverted, inferior versions of males, then why was it considered normal and okay to have sex with 
a female and it not be considered sodomy given that females were actually males who were just messed up? That is such a great question. <laughs> And it actually goes to what we we're in a way what we we're just talking about. But like it doesn't it doesn't actually make sense. So they have to start explaining other things in other ways. And I think sometimes these are actually pushing the bus, right? So um, the 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 official answer is that the Catholic Church relied on Aristotle, and Aristotle thought they were different. So Aristotle actually puts them on opposite poles. And from the what century, Aristotle is the guy who's defining right the basis of Catholic theology on this question. It's interesting that, that I've never had an early modern person put it like that. It's like they wouldn't go there. They do they go there around hermaphrodites, but they don't go there around heterosexual sex. Um, which is which is actually kind of telling, I think. Because you would think that they would, but they don't. Well, one, one of the things that uh, as a professor in France, uh, Denis Cluzet, who's talked, he and his students have talked a great deal in recent years, going back to the idea of the early 40s, about how this is a culture of paradox. Yeah. That, that they're not uncomfortable at all, as Feb said, with this, something being this and that at the same time. Right? We think of this or that. If it's this, sure. it's got to be this and not that, that, that didn't bother them. And you can show this in lots of, lots of different ways. That's a great thing to think of the entire semester. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I always tell my students, one of the classic ways since I work on the French state, is in their political theory, the king's power was absolute but limited. Right? And it made all perfect sense to them. They didn't have any problem understanding this. Right? And, and you hear that and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever. And there are lots of other yeah. There's actually a lot of them. There are actually a lot of them around the body. So yes. So and and around we're just talking about it, about impotence is a kind of classic one that you know God can make this happen except you can't except you can't and that that simultaneity we're good. You know. Well, they, one of the things that's happening in this period is we're shifting the political metaphor because I'm writing about this for a while. The, the, from the body politic, mm -hmm. where the king is the head of the body. Yeah. And I might say that that image in France comes from a woman, Christine de Pizan, mm -hmm. right? That she's the one who creates the image of the body politic that actually used in France. But they're shifting to the king as the father of his people, mm -hmm. right? And they're his children, which is still a connection, but you're not part of the same body anymore. Yeah. You think about it. And they're doing this, for example, under, you know, you start to see this creep in with Charles the Knight. Mm -hmm who's 10 years old, yeah. right? And, and the people are making speeches to him about, you know, the king is the father of his people. Now, and you think, wait a minute, time out with this. He's 10 years old, right? They describe him in one of these, they, they, they're giving a speech about this, and his legs are swinging back and forth because he can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really, you know, yeah. it, there's a kind of nonsense to it that's mm -hmm. really, um, I actually, one of the things that I think is fascinating, this is an aside, but sort of telling, so, I've always wondered about this. No way to prove it, but kind of fascinating. So Louis XIV becomes king when he is three and a half? Four. Four and a half? I don't think that. Doesn't matter. He's like, he's like a wee little kid, right? In fact, on the coins that are minted when he's first, he looks like a child, like, you know, like a, you know, chubby, cheap little infant in a fancy hat. Here's my question. If you saw that, as the father of the people, king of the country, wouldn't you kind of think, what the fuck? You know? Like, seriously. You know, what are there with this war? Seriously, like, what does that do to your, to your metaphors and your political justification? I actually, you know, I don't have anybody who's ever said, oh, no, you know. But it's obvious to me that that's part of what's going on. So sometimes these simultaneities don't Across regions, in terms of how they define masculinity and femininity. Yeah, there are some, um, but there's also a, like it's like a Venn diagram, right? Mm -hmm. There's a huge core that's all kind of the same, and then there are some differences. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, like it's actually more obvious with men, mm -hmm. I think. Women kind of there are all expected to be the same. Yeah. You know, don't step out. If you do step out, don't get caught. Um, by the way, don't get pregnant. Oops, <laughs> right? Um, but 
for men, what, what constitutes masculinity is, is, is the more variable. So you can, you know, in Italy, you can, um, I mean, sort of the famous case is Florence. In Italy, you can be a man who sleeps with men and not be feminine. Mm -hmm. uh, in Spain, a man who sleeps with men is super duper, but there's a whole cat, that's actually one of the earliest sort of identifiable languages that turns into what I would call identity, right? It's actually in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, and it's linked to feminism. So that's a, you know, one of the obvious ones. Um, um, and uh, and one of the areas that where people fight over it is can you be masculine and be say uh, intellectual, or does that necessarily mean you're not? But then, if you're intellectual, what are you? Because women aren't mm -hmm. intellectual. Yeah. I mean, it's not feminine at this point to be highly highly educated, but they are. Mm -hmm. But men who sit around in their in their in their dresses like reading books are kind of you know mm -hmm. suspect. Which is one reason why they, which is one reason why they, they write so much stuff that's like really nasty about women. I mean, I think that's kind of true. Well, if you think about the first two thirds of Hannah, book I'm about, mm -hmm. the last three yeah. parts, but the first two thirds yeah. about, you know, the lion and the fox, and, and mm -hmm. Machiavelli is the fox. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so you get this whole yeah. masculinity thing mm -hmm. specifically about him, never mind the princess. Yeah, but it's also true that, you know, if you read something like, um, I mean, I think you have to read that against also, I mean, Machiavelli is kind of uh, against the next generation of, you know, say, Castiglione and the problem mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. yeah. you know, Well, I mean, Madre Goa is, of course, mm -hmm. great yeah. fun. And that was his most popular thing in lifestyle. No, okay. <laughs> uh, I have this question, I'm not really sure um, how to phrase it. So I. So I'm really intrigued by talking about identities in this period. Um, I went to a Kings and Queens conference this summer, and the entire first day I was talking about how you identify sexualities in this period, and um, you know, but it was everyone was talking about you know it's, it's behaviors, not identities. It's mm -hmm. something you do, not who you are. And sorry, I rolled the message. No, sorry. no, <laughs> it was all new to me. I mean, it was really interesting, and it, I guess I'm wondering. And I guess when you use identities today, we kind of consider your identity something at its deepest level that doesn't change. It's always there. That's kind of inherent a part of who you are. And I just wonder, how do you get at something like identities in this period when the sources that we have are like about performances mm -hmm. and the way that it's seen in, in the public sphere, by a public sphere, um, if you don't really have a source base that talks about kind of like the, your intellectual connection to an identity. How do you conceive of talking about identity? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, okay, first of all, I would say I don't agree with the first day's conclusions. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's actually a little, that's really, certainly during a modern period, it's way too simplistic. Right. Um, and, 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 and it sounds like a little bit like somebody read their Foucault badly. There's yeah. that link, right? Yeah. Foucault doesn't say that, but that's how everybody takes him yeah. to say that you know, sexual identity is created in the 19th century and there wasn't any before. And that's, yeah, and that and, and, and that, acts not behavior, and acts not identity. Yeah, and then it, then, and then, and then, and then the next step, which you know Halperin sort of argues about incoherently, about does that mean that you are that it is something that, you know you feel deeply and you, you know. And here's the thing: I feel like it actually is much more of what sort of how Amy identified it, that people occupy a place that that has a, a that that has an element of a, of sexual identity which they inhabit when they're in that place. So if you are a nun, you're you may be a nun your whole life, you're probably a nun your whole life once more. Um, and that means necessarily that you're occupying a certain kind of sexual identity. Doesn't mean that that, you know, like the architecture of your brain is structured by that? Maybe, maybe not. But I, and I actually think that, that that's still true. Like, I actually, I actually think that if you think about, um, uh, you know, what, thinking about trans as men in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. So it used to be that trans people, you know, if you were, you know, male and you wanted to be female, or you were female and you wanted to be male. And now there are a lot of people who are like, yeah, I'm male, but I want to kind of go to the middle. 
and you see this reflected in discussions about pronouns and things like that. And I think what they're, what they're, what that means, it's, it's somewhat confusing, and you get in a lot of trouble when you teach. Like I, I, when I talk to students, they're like, you know, here's a trans person who, you know, is behaving like this. And like, no, 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 that's wrong. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's all on a, you know, there are all sorts of possibilities. Um, and I think that's actually what it is. The, that's getting at that people aren't necessarily the one thing. Yeah, you may be, you know, heterosexually inspired all of your life in terms of what you do. Does that mean that, you know, the first thing out of your mouth is, hi, I'm heterosexual? No, right? Um, uh, and in fact, it may not be where all your thoughts are, or all your desires are, or all your fantasies are, and like, I mean, I think it's a much more complicated thing. So in early modern sources, how does that show up? I think it shows up in this kind of people are what they are when you understand them to be what they present to be. And then it becomes increasingly more difficult if they don't actually are not legible. Um, and when it reaches a certain point of illegibility, usually things go wrong. So some of these cases are fascinating. Like, you know, Catalina de Arauso goes, you know, how does she pee on a ship? <laughs> These are the questions yes. I have, because I always think like this. Like, okay, how do you get across the Atlantic on a boat the size of this table with 60 men on it, and none of them notice that you don't have it? Her period. What happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? Did she just not have it? Did she just not have it? Did she just, so just like, earth? you know, hang yeah. off the edge and go, sorry guys, just ignore me, I'm having a lot of poop. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, really, the text is always faster. Female, no, they 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 Passes you know, herself off as a man. Exactly. So, so well, there are plenty of nuns who, who say who dresses men in, right. in, in our monasteries in the same sort of exactly. way. Exactly. You, you, you know, the, like the technicalities of this become sort of part of the part of the question here to me. And and uh, almost always when somebody does something like this, we know because they got caught, and we know that they got caught because it's a problem. Um. So. Hang on. But who's it? Who's it a problem for? Fans. Is it? It's usually because we're reading, you know, from legal standards and like, mm -hmm. people who are more bothered by this. But are there contemporaries really bothered by that, or is it some other issue that then it just comes forward? It, it, it really does depend. So, so there's sort of two models. One, one, and I, I actually think this is really true for sodomy. I think that sodomy is one of those things where people don't care until they care. That you have so many cases where. Everybody knew that Baker was, you know, doing it in the basement with young men, not boys, young men. They didn't care until they got in a fight with the sexton. And now everybody cares because there's like disruption in the neighborhood. So I think a lot of the time, people don't care until they care. You know, the, the, if I could come in just for one second. So I had a student named Brendan Hill, who's now a dean of the kids, who um, wrote a dissertation on verbal crime in the 17th century. And one of the things that research a lot was the Society for the Reparation of Wars. Mm -hmm. right? yep. And one That's of the, the fascinating model. things yeah. about them is that there's a couple of years and almost all people prosecuted for verbal crime. Right? Yeah. Right? So there's a couple of prosecutions. He looked at all the records in, in a couple of different court sessions. Mm -hmm. right? Most of the time, one every two years, nobody really cares. And then all of a sudden, in the 16, like 1693 to 95, yeah, exactly. there's like 200 people prosecuted in Lancashire. And then it stops again. Yeah. All right, the same society could care less about so called mm -hmm. sodomy. And then suddenly, in you know, about care. 1710, they care, care. And for about three years, they're prosecuted, they're closing the Molly houses, they're like doing all them. kinds of. And then they stop again. They stop again. It, it, he could not find a, I mean, there's a couple of specific people that yeah. touched this. Yeah. Like yeah. But it, it was fascinating. I'm just kind of, it's exactly what you're describing. And then, and then back down, and then nobody cares. This is really, this is, a, this is, this is, I think, way more common than real. So it's like, it's often just like one person cares. And often one person cares only about one person. So, so this is, the model is most obvious in, Spain, where there are professional denouncers, but they're also, you're allowed to denounce anybody if you think, right? So most of the time, nobody does, because really, do you want to talk to the Inquisition more generally? It's kind of like, no, right? But every once in a while, somebody gets really jacked up about one of these things, for whatever reason. 
you know, my guess is a lot of it is quite frankly bigotry. Like they don't like the, you know, Alino looks kind of weird, right? So they go and they, and and almost invariably, if you're wearing the wrong clothes, you're you're already in trouble with the church. So it's an easy one in a sense, but but we only hear about it when people care. It's re what's really weird. Like the Catalina story is fascinating because it ends with her, you know, chatting with the Pope and getting and going back and being Antonio. What the hell? That never happens. They basically leave her alone. Wasn't that because she claimed she was a virgin? Right. Yeah, when she gets off the first time because she claims she's a virgin, but she goes back to Europe, has, you know, another series of adventures in which she doesn't kill anyone, which is good because really that's tacky, and then goes back to the New World and lives out her life. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that a lot of people don't care what you do in the New World. If you're there, you know, I mean... She was also upper class, mm -hmm. and that, that yeah. certainly helped her. I mean, she was from an honorable family and oh, had yeah. connections, so well, don't think that would have happened as easily for oh, yeah. sort of others, others. Yeah. like Tom Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and and I think, you know, and, but there's also a huge number of people who I suspect are doing things, you know, wandering in and out mm -hmm. of these stories. Prostitutes are another really great example. They, they, you know, most prostitutes aren't prostitutes as they're all the time job. They wander in and out of it. They only get in trouble when they get in trouble because somebody in the society of the Restoration of is going to be up his butt, right? And and most of them want you know go in and out of it, and there's I think mean, there's a huge amount of this happening. So um, I think people only get in trouble because somebody's upset about it, or they do something that's so disruptive that they can't they can't be born. Um, and sometimes it's an accident. I have a great story about that. I was just thinking, getting back to Natalie's question about about um, sources and stuff on this, and that um, you're talking about that when it becomes a problem, and so that's more about deviant sexualities. Uh, and so when you mentioned nuns, and that's yeah. what I'm working on right now, is, is the Reformation. Nuns? Virginity. Maybe nuns? And so yeah, yeah. Deeper nuns always. Um, but but that for them, it's something that they actually write about quite positively all yeah. the time. It is virginity, and so you yeah. get it from them. And so it's interesting to me, and I just want to get my mind of like you know wives and, and husbands and stuff. And Luther talks about, you know, the joys of marriage and the joys of sex and kind of, yeah, so all that. But that so you do you do get this kind of positive heterosexual um, uh, identity that comes through in marriage literature. Uh, and so, um, but it also comes up in crisis, so like when the nuns are being attacked in the Reformation, you know, yep. they have to talk about their virginity, virginity in a different way because now they're defending it in a way yep. they didn't before. So, so there's sources like that that you can come up with. Um, that are that are ego literature basically mm -hmm. um, of them talking about these things, but not in a deviant way. And oh yeah, there's a huge. Way. There's actually a lot yeah. of. Uh, I mean, and it's not just people um, doing. I mean, this goes back to to Jim's personal. It's not just prescriptive stuff about marriage. People talk about how much they love being married. They love their husbands. Mm -hmm. They love. Yeah. And sometimes they talk in their yeah. lives. And sometimes they talk in really like you know, whew, explicit. <laughs> you know, man. You know. They're doing, and they're really. I mean, it's kind of shocking. And I thought I was untouchable. Um, uh, so there is, and there, you know. On the other hand, if you had to, you know, if you could wake them up and say, "Excuse me," you know, would they recognize that wife as a sexual identity is permanent? They would say, "They would say, no, 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 no. That's you know, until I die, or he dies, and then it becomes something else." So there's a way in which they know that, even as they're inhabiting it. Yeah. In a way that maybe we don't. I read something yesterday which really fascinating. I was reading some of the woman's, just the fact woman's men watch the 17th century. See, that's super nerd dumb if you think that's fascinating. <laughs> 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 Sorry. But, and she's talking about soldiers in the area during the fold. Mm -hmm. And um, she, to protect herself from household goes to a nearby castle. Mm -hmm. And all of the women in the area come with them mm -hmm. under her protection. Yeah. All right, so they all go there. And then the officer in charge of the army, and I think it's the soldiers from Gavan, is of course a nobleman. They know him, mm -hmm. so you know, she discusses with him. He gives her guarantees and whatnot. And she says, well, you know, after we had guarantees and we had, the, you know, it's clearly laid out that this would be okay, the old women left the castle. But the young women and girls still stay here. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, yeah. I mean, this is the kind of detail a 
about their attitudes towards yeah. sexuality or yeah. their attitudes towards what rape as a weapon yeah. of war because it's clearly yeah. being used as, yeah. a, as a terror. Yeah. Right. No, I, I no. It, there's a way in which um, uh, I've actually seen this not in that much detail, but I but where old women have much more play because they're not. It is it is presumed that they are not going to be sexual targets. Um, uh, so you know. Find yeah, I, this is more of a methodological question, but you've discussed how like we have very different conceptions of gender and sexual identity now versus the early modern era, and we also have very different words that we use. Mm -hmm. When do you decide that you're going to use a word like trans or intersex when those didn't really exist in the same way? Uh, well, okay, so if I'm talking about hermaphrodites, as I did in this piece, I use hermaphrodites because they use hermaphrodites, but I think I wrote the note that says, by the way, this is what this usually means. Um, for trans stuff, I, this came up a lot in the, in the book I just wrote, and, and I'm, it'll be interesting to see what people say. I've already gotten in a little bit of trouble, so let me illustrate by way of different work. So I, um, I refer to castrated men almost entirely in this book as castrates which is at once an identifying term and a neutral term. That is, castrati is actually a pejorative term, period. And calling someone a unit is very much a pejorative term. So what do you, how do you make a neutral word? Well, if you were talking about them as an archaeologist, you would call them castrates. He referred to castrated animals and castrated people and castrates. So this is what I chose to do, knowing that disability people would say, you're identifying them as disabled, like you're calling them their disability. No. Yes, but I'm doing it on purpose to both, you know, take away the pejorative version of it and give them, you know, a, a, a word to inhabit. So it's a very deliberate choice that, you know, I try to make as very, as deliberate choices as I can about some of this. Um, Anybody who writes in sexuality has that obligatory note that says, homosexuality, da da da, heterosexuality, da da da. Um, so what do you do, right? Well, you know, sometimes you just have to use modern words because they're the only thing. Unless you want to say, instead of heterosexual, here's a man having sex with a woman in order to have either babies or pleasure in a manner in which men and women have sex together. Or you could say, Heterosexual. Star, asterisk, note. I do not assume that people I understand themselves to be exclusively interested in. So you're always having to kind of, you know, make that statement somewhere explicitly. Um, uh, uh, or, you know, take the risk, use a word, and watch people go, or both. Um, so, um, uh, if you don't take the time to write the note, somebody will say either you're ignorant or you're bigoted or both. So you just, like I have a note and I basically change one word in it each time I write anything so that it's not the exact same note, but it's the exact same note. And you know, it goes the first use of any word that even resembles something and it's just there on, it's just on page one, maybe page two, right? especially when we're gonna talk about penguins for a while. <laughs> Um, but it, you know, it, it, there isn't a satisfactory way of doing it, and there are a lot of people who don't agree with what I, everything I've just said. Who say, no, 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 no. There's, you know, sexual identity is something people invest in in the modern period, and before that, people don't. And I just, I just suspect that that's just wrong. Um, and I suspect that one of the major reasons it's wrong is that people figured out pretty early on that sex kind of feels good, right? Uh, and there are hormones that help us, you know, like be interested in sex. And there are hormones that help women remember that that they like sex even after they've had childbirth. Because really, they didn't. The first time they cast a bowling ball through their legs, childbirth would be the last. <laughs> so, you're, you know, nature does a lot of this. So, uh, my suspicion is that. You know, we're always sort of trying to kind of explain ourselves relative to these, to these you know, formulations of which we have and not agreed to, but a lot of people don't agree. Again, I live in Tennessee. There's like a whole like mess of people there who think that I'm, you know, 
something akin to the devil from thinking this way. Awesome. I get denounced in the press all the time. They say, could not be reached for comment, which apparently means they have neither a phone nor email. But that's another story. Yeah, yes. But given like the vast breadth of cultural history that we have from like literature and art and whatnot, wouldn't they know that people like sex and you But they're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> they're not supposed to. According to the, the yeah. written by people who are not supposed to be thinking about sex. <laughs> right. yeah. Not yeah. 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 either, if they are. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well. <laughs> details, details. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, uh, Christianity is, you know, a big bad player in those. Big surprise. <laughs> um, uh, and, and before I get fried for this, I wish to say that um, I was Catholic for many years until I gave it up for Lent. <laughs> so, you know, we've been, the, the, one of the things that's up at work that a lot of what, what students have been reading a lot of the Kaye de Bolles from the 16th century, mm -hmm. there's actually a lot more of that than people yeah. realize. And this kind of discussion is just incredibly common. I mean, you can have these books in the last year they talk yeah. about that, but issues about sexuality, issues about gender, there's stuff about, you know, in local calles about the Salic Wash and Plot Regents as well as Queens. Yeah, yeah, and, I heard you know, yes. all kinds of all kinds of other things like this. And it's just fascinating that this is a topic that again all across France, lots of different people are creating these calles from different mm -hmm. walks of life, different social backgrounds. In the 16th century, and this is true. I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, play a certain amount of this for loss, but it is true that the huge issue is consistently until the 20th century is pregnancy, and the um, problem of not being able to reliably have heterosexual sex and not have babies. It's an economic problem. It's a social problem. The reason that communities care. Is not some abstract principle. I don't think. I don't think it's even. You know, it's not religion. It's oh my God, we're going to have to take care of another bastard, and we don't want to. We can't, and we don't want to. So, uh, and until the, until they solve that, you know, this is this is one of those things that appears everywhere. I mean, that, that's you know, English. And the Italians will, will defend. There are places in in, in, in Italy in the in the in the 16th century where people will defend sodomy as, hey, no babies. Now they get in trouble for saying that, but they keep saying it, and they don't get in as much trouble as you think for saying it. Um, well, the, when they attack the priests for and, and virtually every calle yeah. in, in let's say 1576 yeah. attacks priests for uh, sex all the time, right? Um, <laughs> The, the, it's interesting because there's, there's a multi-layer to this. First of all, the, the priest has a con. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they have children. Mm -hmm. And third of all, even worse, he goes to court to get the children legitimized. And almost always, yeah. the three things are sometimes about a specific priest, but just in general, the priests start doing, you know, they're having sex, they're yeah. half-compromised, they have children, and they're naturalizing, they're legitimizing. Well, then, so, so you know, if you're a if you're a French person who um, is giving away a certain amount of your, you know, income or produce or whatever, and the deal was, dude was supposed to be celibate, and instead, you're paying for him to go to court to get his kids legitimate. No wonder they're pissed, right? Yep. So, it's absolutely, uh, you know, driving the, that bus. Sure. Um, uh, there was one guy that was my favorite from 1614 where they insisted the king make the priest take the concubine because then he'd leave their wives and daughters. Right, right. now that's actually like <laughs> the 15th and 16th century they like having them. Yeah. Because they leave their own wives and daughters alone. Yeah, exactly. So, so I'll go the other way. There are a lot of complaints about that after, after the, in, you know, after um, 1215, like, wait a minute, this isn't good. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, you know, I mean, here I am at a, at a um, uh, Catholic school, I'm going to say it. Just, that was such a mistake. Well, there's no Jesuits then. Celibate clergy. Celibate clergy. There's actually, my, my, my mother taught for years at, at Loyola Marymount. And, um, uh, and 
her boss this year, who's a big surprise to Jesuit, who told a, a joke, which I will not tell you, in which in Jesuit, it's not dirty, it's just a little, you know, off the illogical color. Um, so the old Jesuit dies, and he's been so good, he goes up, you know, he goes up to the pearly gates, and St. Peter says, dude, you've been such a great priest, you've been awesome, you know, we, you know, normally when you arrive, when you first arrive, you just let you in, and, you know, there's no, but you were such a good guy that we want to give you a special, like, you know, take it to one of our special things we have here in heaven. And, you know, like we have a pool, and there's some, you know, lovely angels there, and, and, and so on. Jesuit says, oh, can I go to the library? I'd really like to see the Holy of Holies library. She's like, sure, dude, whatever. Here, here's your library card. Knock yourself out. Do to die, you know, Peter's doing his thing. I was saying, Peter's Shit! Oh, this is just, oh, shit! Excuse me? Oops. Does that say Peter? It says celebrate, not celibate. <laughs> Told by a Jesuit at a Jesuit well, school. <laughs> Must be one of those left things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Liberation theology. Yeah. Yeah. One of those. <laughs> but, um, uh, but it is, you know, I, uh, I, I don't spend as much time on uh, in my work on the you know, sort of economic issues of what it means to be, you know, worried about this all the time. But it certainly is one of the things that comes in repeatedly in the conversation. Um, uh, and I think is that it, it, it is really if there's a if there's a block on them figuring out that, you know, men and women could actually treat each other like with respect with respect to say gender and sex, that's it. It's that women have babies and babies are a problem and they're really expensive and they're really a problem. And the fact that new men don't own up to being part of the problem, well, you know, he's possible. They still don't. So why would they then? Um, well, I'm not cynical or anything. <laughs> but you also argue that's one of the reasons that women at the time buy into patriarchy, because patriarchy is going to protect them from all that. Yes, so, and, and it never does, and they're and always surprised. But, I mean, I, I so, mean, it but really they're so vulnerable in that system yeah. that that they need to have protections for them. The also. only protection I think it offers is that, to some degree, part of what it's about is that older men, not necessarily my age, but a little younger, protecting them from the young men. Mm -hmm. That patriarchy where the older men control the men 18 to 25 were incredibly violent and very dangerous for women. That it does offer yeah. some protection, it, it episodically, I would say. Yes, often theoretically, but it's their theory. Yes. Which is, you know, not nothing. Although my feelings are okay. And you know, you can always lock them in the house as you talk about it in certain parts of your own. One more question, because they have asked us to get out of here at about 510, because there's another event in no. here. Um, and uh, Chris told me we should try to get out of here at 510. And we can continue, we continue upstairs, for those who are new to this, we have wine and cheese afterwards upstairs to ask more questions. So my question actually um, is sort of bringing us back a bit to some of the things that we talked about last semester in the bike seminars, which for those of you who didn't attend, we just spent a lot of time talking about sort of research and methodology for graduate students. And I guess one of the questions that I had just sort of been thinking about um, your whole corpus of work is just how exactly the, pro the progression happened from being sort of an early modern France yeah. specialist to being a broader yeah. early modern Europeanist uh, more generally. Because one of the things that really struck me in reading the article for today was just how little France was present. Yeah. And I was wondering how that happened intellectually and what kind of um, challenges did you yeah. face in making that transformation? Um, yeah, actually, I'm giving a talk in Vancouver in about 10 days, and the, one of the French people said, how much France is there? And I searched in the paper, and it's like a 45 inch. Like, France comes up twice, two sentences, <laughs> that thing. Oops. Uh, so yeah, I was trained by a French historian to do French history. 
right? Um, part of it is that I was always interested in gender, and gender is not just a French thing. So I was predisposed to be, you know, I was actually also interested in images when I originally started. Um, my dissertation was like 70 pictures. You know, it's just kind of crazy now. Um, and that was, a, again, broadly European. Um, so in a sense, I had to kind of you know, do the thing to get a job thing. Um, and then the other, so that was partly, you know, the pragmatics of graduate school. And then when I got a job, um, I was telling Jim this, that my department at the time was like, with learning the rolling issues and crisis of the humanities. Never happens, right? You're such a lunch. <laughs> and um, they said, you know, could you teach something that would get enrollments, please? And I said, well, how about sex? <laughs> yeah, how about a porn class? Uh, and I doubled the department's enrollments in one class. <laughs> um, and got announced in the U.S. Senate for my trouble. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of it was that that pushed me in the direction of uh, you know, teaching pushed me. It's not supposed to happen that way, right? It's supposed to be you teach what you research. No, no, no. I research what I teach. Um, and um, uh, and I also. Uh, it's sort of hard to explain, but 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 it is true. I actually think of sex as a gender problem rather than sex as sex. So I'm much more interested in it as what does it mean. Uh, that we have created historically, I mean, my big question is why have we created it, how have we created it, it's historically such a huge problem around gender that's built around sex. And if we could figure that out, could we maybe dismantle it? And, you know, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> um, but that's really the thing that, so, like, my, my partner, is really interested in gender and, and says, you spend an awful lot of time thinking about sex, and then she always says, except you don't. And it's true, I don't. I mean, I, I, um, it's my way in, too. And again, that's about Europe. It's not, you know, France is only one piece of that. And, and um, so I'll take stuff wherever I find it. Right, right now I'm reading, you know, uh, 16th century, Plays, French, Spanish, English, uh, uh, and um, what's next? Well, my family's actually Irish, so I am reading some stuff in Irish. Why not? Nobody looks Irish. Uh, and it's really just kind of what, you know, where does it, where does it, where is it the same and where is it different? And, and so in that sense, I've become much more interested in that area of questions. Um, um, and I, you know, I taught myself enough German that I can read it, don't ask me to speak it. But I can, you know, get my way through it so that, again, I can, you know, see what's going on. Um, uh, so you, that's the biggest problem is being able to go it out. Like, I'd love to know more Swedish because there's a great book that's in Swedish, but it's not. So, I think that's a, is it sort of a series of yeah. steps that weren't planned entirely. Um, just follow the what was of the original interest. But in this way, you can just so That's a question actually we're going to touch upon a lot deliberately, actually, in terms of who I invited to this in the spring. Um, because all the people who have seen the spring have either done second or later books or are working on a second book. It's significantly different than what they did the first time. And they've all moved in a direction, often more globally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's obviously a direction the field's going. Um, and so that's a deliberate choice, and I think it shows you how the, you know, the generation that I'm in, most of the people uh, stayed who were French historians mm -hmm. stayed in France, mm -hmm. more or less. Right? I mean, Jim Farr did book on artists in Europe, and most of the rest of us have done a little bit of stuff outside. But um, for the most part, they stayed within, and that's no longer the case. And I think that's really important for all of you in your training. We talk about this all the time. But you, know, you can't be that old fashioned kind of historian again anymore. 
whether you want to be or not, and get a job. Yeah, kind of thing, yeah. Quite far from anything else. We talked so. about this as the two counties in Kentucky are all like, nobody cares. They might care if but one of the counties in Kentucky was having conversations with China, but they're not going to care about two counties in Kentucky, believe me. Um, one other thing is, um, my first language was actually, uh, in sight English, was Latin. So I, in that sense, I was weird. Like, I always thought of things that way. So, so it would be a European yeah, cultural scale. Yeah. 